Welcome to the Undisciplined Podcast. This is your host, Nico Beitendach. Today we're talking to Dan Bessner, professor at the University of Washington and co-host of the awesome brand new podcast, American Prestige. We talk about the role, the past and the future of public intellectuals. It's a cracking episode. The intro music is by a friend of the show, Greta. The track is called Saline. The link to his SoundCloud page is in the show description. Without further ado, let's go. Thank you for talking to me today, Dan. Um, if you don't mind, before we get into the questions, do you mind just giving like a short background on maybe your academic history and trajectory on how you got to where you are now and the topics that interested you? Yeah, sure. So um, I I did an undergraduate degree uh, in a dual degree program, I actually got two undergraduate degrees, one from Columbia School of General Studies, one from the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, at Columbia. I majored in modern European history at JTS. I majored in Jewish history. Uh, I spent a year um, between college and graduate school just doing work for a company that no longer exists named Stephen Barry's. Uh, I went to graduate school intending to study European history, a bit unclear about what subject precisely, but uh, I knew I wanted to study history. Uh, And then in grad school, I kind of switched to becoming a transatlantic historian or a historian of both the US and Euro, uh, Europe um, through this biography of Hans Speyer that I did. Um, and then um, I was always interested in foreign policy. My senior year of college, I interned at the Council on Foreign Relations. That was, I think, spring 2006. So, you know, during the height of the Iraq war. And so this was always a question of intellectuals influence in U.S. foreign policy, which I saw firsthand at the Council on Foreign Relations and was a, a topic that became um, of interest to me. I noticed in your work, one of, and you just mentioned the work you did on Hans Speyer and so on, um, that one of the themes in your work that I notice is kind of this idea of the academic or the the intellectual within the public sphere, and that there's a you you look at the history of that quite a bit. What do you consider to be the role of the academic or the public intellectual, and do you think that that in the last let's say in the last century or so? Do you think that that role has changed? Well, I think there's a a historical role of what that uh, person, that academic intellectual has done, and then there's a normative role of what they should do. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what what they have done, I think there's a a broad division between those who advise and those who actually go into the government and make decisions themselves. Um, You know, those who advise are people who work on think tanks, who write reports, who are um, parts of of the official bureaucracy of the state itself. And then there are people like Henry Kissinger or Walt Rostow, who have social science PhDs, uh, Kissinger in in government from Harvard, and then Rostow in economic history. Um, And I think that there's a division between those two groups. Uh, And I think, you know, even though the issue areas have changed, I focus on national security policy. I mean, there are, you could speak, you could tell similar stories in other domestic policy arenas and domestic policy arenas rather. I think that, um, that those two categories have held relatively stable since let's say the Mm. post world war one period and the true, you know, coming to age of the social sciences in the teens, the twenties and the thirties. Um, now, what the role should be is I think that I, I think any post-industrial knowledge-driven society, and of course industrial society as well, but we're at a different stage in this country or a different, you know, moment. Not, I'm not a stages thinker, but we're at a different moment. Um, I think that you do need experts, um, people who have really devoted themselves to particular topics, but the expertise needs to be tempered with some form of not only democratic accountability, so you know the experts don't just get recycled within these institutions, mm-hmm. both of the state or parastate institutions like think tanks, um, and also perhaps even more importantly, democratic accountability is it's meaningful democratic input into what is done. Now, the question is: some questions will be of technical, uh, extremely technical questions that you know the average citizen might not be able to meaningfully speak to, but there are quite a few questions about values. 
and what particular um, uh, path a given uh, society should take in terms of public policy that you know any person should be able to speak to, even though they've been included as technical questions when they're not really. Right. So I've been also in engaging with your work. What struck me was that, as we all know, in the pre World War II and post World War II years, many European scientists, especially from Germany, immigrated to yes to England, but also largely to the United States. But what I found interesting in your work is you highlight the scholars from social sciences and the humanities, perhaps, that moved to the United States in big numbers in, in the same period. Uh, for example, a, a kind of typical case would be at what became the New School. Yes, famously the New School, yes. Right. Do you think you, you can tell me whether you think that that influx of European and specifically German social scientists, did that have an strong effect on the social sciences in the United States and oh absolutely absolutely I mean it's the introduction of I think two um, even three significant strands of thought and all of these do have American antecedents but I do think that the influx really changed them one you get the genuine introduction of Max Weber Hmm. into American sociology, um, and you have and not only American social uh, sociology, American social science and, and humanistic thinking at large. There are some precedents with Talcott Parsons, who, of course, studied at Heidelberg hmm. in the 20s, but I think it's really the influx of emigres that make Weber, you know, into the American canon. You might even say the same in terms of someone like Durkheim and Freud, hmm. um, that though they were read in the U.S., they really become, you know, genuinely, you know, part of the canon, I think, with the immigration. Uh, and the same is, is, is to some degree true of Marx as well. Of course, Marx always read also in the United States, um, but I think he becomes like part of the academic canon really with the influx of exiles and, and also the Cold War makes, you know, the study of Marx important for Americans, given that his influence on Soviet ideology or presumed influence on Soviet ideology. And so those are like the two, two, two strands. And I think you also get the introduction of critical theory. Uh, actually, uh, sorry. So the, the 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 people that I just mentioned were number one. Number two is critical theory emerging from the Frankfurt School, and then you know just really informing the development of the humanities, humanities and social sciences, both in Germany, Western Europe writ large, and and the United States as well. You know Judith Butler, you know uh, critical theorists like that, um, and then obviously you know, the Frankfurt School really influences Foucault and a bunch of other major uh, influential intellectuals, and then you have the sort of, sort of more positivistic side of European social science embodied by someone, let's say, like Paul Lazarsfeld, whose Bureau of Applied Social Research at Columbia is a really influential in spreading more quantitative approaches throughout the American Academy. And I think those three strands of thinking, you know, um, you know the canon, critical theory, and more quantitative positivist approaches, which all have European, sorry, not European, which all have American antecedents, are really um, pushed forward by the influx of exiles in the 30s and 40s and beyond. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned the role of Talcott Parsons, because from my understanding, towards the end of his life, he felt slightly neglected in the United States. And when he visited Europe, he was sort of surprised to see that people were actually still reading him and engaging with him in Europe much more than in America. Yeah, because so I imagine that's in the 70s, right? Yes, yes. Towards the end of his life. Because 68 is, I think, another sort of um, marking point in the history of American social science, where it diversifies both in terms of who's studying and what is being studied. Mm. Um, and that I think that the, the effects of that in Europe are different than they are in the United States. Mm. Yeah. And then also you mentioned this quantitative approach or empirical approach that gained more prominence in that time. You also write about how basically in the 20th century or post in the Cold War in the post-World War II period, this kind of quantitative in scare quotes scientific approach to social sciences such as international relations or political science, that this came, the, this quantitative approach came to dominate well, I guess and no. I mean, I think realist thinking is not especially quantifiable. Mm. Um, like neo -real the neorealism of someone like Kenneth Waltz, who's very influenced, in my opinion, at least by someone like Hans Morgenthau, 
is a model of international relations, but it's more of a qualitative model than it is a quantitative one. Um, so, but I did think formalist, I do think formalistic thinking um, dominated IR, if not necessarily always quantitative thinking. Do you think that that is still the case? Or do you think that there's a kind of a reversal happening again at the moment? Um, well, I do think that I would say younger generations of scholars, people under 40 or 45 in IR, now this is not my discipline, so it's mm. just an kind of an observer. I'm an observer based on anecdotal information. They they do appreciate the importance of qualitative approaches and particularly judgment, and, and they do appreciate that um, modelization and quantification sometimes occludes more than it illuminates. So I do think that you know there's been a recent revival of classical realism in IR that is partially um, impelled by a search for more qualitative approaches. Um, so uh, I do think there's an element like that there. Um, but I also, um, yeah, I think the discipline seems less enthralled to purely quantitative approaches than it might have been in the past. Do you think that is just the kind of a, a natural cycle that's playing out? Or do you think that that is because of the problems that we face globally, that they have a different character to them that requires a more penetrating approach? No, I think that there is, uh, I mean, human beings have always been human beings and they always required a qualitative approach. Ultimately, I don't think you're going to be ever, I think ontologically in terms of how one would understand reality or how one, you know, epistemologically how one would understand how we know what we know. Um, there's a lot that will be missed out necessarily by trying to by trying to quantify or model human behavior. Um, I just think now there's less of a face in scientific reason, generally speaking, given the failures over the past 40, 50 years, to, you know, to really prevent war, to prevent climate change, to prevent inequality, to prevent pandemic. So there's a there's a clear understanding that the tools of the, you know, that the high modernist and you know, post high modernist period um, aren't really as effective as one might have hoped in, you know, the 50s. Yeah. So I'm happy that you mentioned climate change for one, because this is what I have in mind when I say that the nature of global problems are changing compared to a century ago. Or at least we're recognizing them as different. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I was listening to your, your newest podcast episode on climate change, and I, I really enjoyed that. The, the kind of deeper or longer analysis of that. Oh, thank you. Uh, and so people listening, subscribe to American Prestige. That's the name of the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> please do. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in the in the top of the episode anyway. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed that as a side note because, sorry, I forgot your your guest's name. But uh, Keith Plimers. Keith Plimers. But because I feel like this is, but I feel like this is this this problem is in terms of its scale somehow novel for uh, for humanity, of course, but also for the academic or the intellectual, whatever you want to call it, as a real problem. It prevents new problems. I think that's fair. I think the scale that uh, uh, of climate change as experienced in twenty twenty one. Um, it feels different and is different than previous, you know, instances of climate change uh, in, in, you know, the, the 12,000 year long history of human settlement and human cause, cause climate change. Mm. Um, and so I think that's fair. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I think that all human problems from climate change on down um, are amenable um, and very much so to qualitative approaches, whether it's, you know, think about a lot of the quantitative ways IR scholars have attempted to approach the cause of war or why wars continue or counterinsurgency or what have you. I think all of these approaches would benefit from a qualitative understanding of what's going on, a historical understanding of what's going on, a cultural understanding, etc. I'm wondering, uh, like agreeing that we need to tackle this qualitatively, but I'm I'm wondering, doesn't the scale of the problem, isn't that perhaps one of the reasons that we're thinking about these issues qualitatively again, instead of number crunching? Yes, I'm sure I'm sure there's something to that. Yeah. Right. Because they're questions of value, right? No quantitative uh, analysis is going to tell you how much you should consume. That's mm. ultimately a question of value. And so I think that the issues of climate change necessarily lead you to more philosophical and, and qualitative um, frameworks.
Yeah. So you also, during the sticking to this topic, but in a slightly different tangent, you co-authored a paper a couple of years ago during the Trump administration about uh, his administration being a climate behemoth. Yes, with uh, Matthew Spark of UCSC, yes. Yeah, yeah, within the framework of uh, climate leviathans. And we know about the various horrible things that the Trump administration did, particularly pertaining to, to the climate. But do you think that your analysis at that time, are you now, a few years later, more hopeful about the U.S. government's trajectory no, I'm on not that? hopeful at all. I'm not hopeful at so all. So you don't think um, it's Trump's behemoth? Whatsoever. It's it's the behemoth, the behemoth of capitalism, of which Trump was a particularly grotesque expression, mm -hmm. um, is what I would say, the behemoth of um, an extractivist capitalism that dominates North Atlantic, and I would even say at this point, global ideology, and, um, ideologies of growth, ideologies of extractivism. Um, which I think, you know, move, move beyond just the North Atlantic at this point or evidence elsewhere in the world. If for under, as we talked about on the interview, for understandable historical reasons, I, 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 nothing has demonstrated to me that people who wield the levers of power on one hand or people who benefit from various globalized relationships have the um, wherewithal or ability or even at this point knowledge um, to, to do what, what is necessary to uh, not only, not even just reverse climate change, which may be impossible at this point, seems impossible, but even arrest its worst effects. I'm very pessimistic about uh, anything like that happening. Do you think that within academia, within scholarship, that can we still have faith in that, that that's going to have a positive effect? No, I don't know when we would ever have had faith in that. Scholarship is just, I mean, I support it as a humanist, but I, I, I don't know that it's not activism. Mm -hmm. um, and m most, you know, ideas that inform public policy, sometimes they come from the academy, but oftentimes they come from interstitial institutions uh, and don't come from the pure academic space. So the university as a space is to me. Um, not necessarily the most um, important or meaningful site of activism. And I don't think it necessarily ever was, even if it is the bastion of, of, of what might be called broadly progressive to incorporate both liberalism and the left, mm -hmm. um, even if the university has remained a bastion of, of progressive thought in a society that um, is not especially progressive. Yeah, and then also that your work highlights quite well is how during the cold war government or policy wonks st stopped paying attention to academia and instead moved to private think tanks like the rand corporation etc right yes that is um that is a partial phenomenon i would actually on that question um the person who has written the most about that is joy Rohde, R H. R O H D E. She's at the University of Michigan, I believe, in their public, the Ford Public Policy School. And her book, Armed with Expertise, is really excellent on exploring the shift from what she calls like the gray zone, these sort of interstitial mm -hmm. institutions, the purely private, um, pur purely private um, spaces, totally outside democratic control. And, and Joy's written an excellent um, a Journal of American History article on that question, and her book armed with expertise is definitely worth checking out if you're interested in exploring that issue at more depth. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. So while, while we're talking about the climate crisis and the climate behemoth, I keep thinking that what we see at the moment right now with COVID-19, how much it just feels like a kind of a dress rehearsal for when climate catastrophe is really going to hit home. And I think this, we see this too in, in what you talk about, the climate behemoths. Um, you know, for, for example, we saw with COVID how quickly first world nations bought up vaccines as quickly as right. they could. Yes. And we see how, despite, for example, South Africa and India petitioning to let go of those patents, 
you know, the the world superpowers are fighting on the side of these corporations to keep their patents for for vaccines. So it just really feels to me that we see this kind of like very explicit realism at play and that it makes me very skeptical when climate change gets more and more real to expect that the the script is going to play out any differently. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I don't see that happening. I, I think that the global inequalities reflected in the present global economy uh, are going to remain and be um, uh, and manifest in, in different ways and in, in novel ways in terms of what they're manifesting in. But, you know, that reflect these long-standing power relationships that began with the era of colonialism in the 16th century, late 15th century, rather. Yeah, so uh, I know this is a almost impossibly big question but i'm i'm going to ask it anyway uh go for it if, if if i'm trying to think of a way out of this one suggestion that i think i picked up from reading your work um correct me if i'm wrong is the the idea that we need a kind of that very shortly after the second world war moment of that, that very brief window where there was a belief in international organizations and international cooperation, which in your analysis, you say ultimately was died in the cradle because of the cold war. But do you still think that that's a way out of this? Ideally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have a international organization. I, I'm not sure inter international law is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just always from its beginning been so affected by the fact that it's basically served as a um, uh, serve the interests of the great powers. Mm -hmm. So a genuinely democratic international law would be a good idea. A genuinely democratic organization like the UN, you know, with, with uh, actually not only democratic at the level of leadership, but democratic at the level of the world's populations would be. I think an important step in the right direction, um, but I just I, I just don't see that happening um, in any meaningful way. Uh, and uh, you know, the workers' revolution doesn't appear to me to be around the corner. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's important not to be blackpilled um, and you know to really continue to try to in in engender political change. But I think one has to do it if not necessarily from a cynical or pessimistic perspective, from a realistic perspective and appreciate the power as it's presently aligned and where it's aligned and who it's aligned with and, and who it's not. You say keep keep doing the work, keep going forward, but in which direction do you think this is the most uh, productive? I don't know. I mean, to be frank, like uh, my, my general analysis of the situation as sort of a general principle and I might be wrong and people might disagree with me is that we have the vestiges of the mass institutions of the first half of the 20th century without the practical political power of democratic input that a mm -hmm. lot of policy choices have been basically removed from the, the actual functioning of the democratic states. So take the George Floyd protests, mm -hmm. which I think were, were some of the largest protests in generation and, you know, for the noble cause of ending police violence, particularly against, against black Americans and people of color. Um, and I think that that hasn't necessarily engendered a lot of, you know, changes on the ground, partially because the system is so designed to ensure that those mass moments of political protest don't engender change on the ground. So the question is, how do we transform the system or make those sorts of large scale mobilizations politically meaningful? And that's a large question to which I don't have the precise answer. Um, but I do think that, you know, left wing experts could maybe on the margins begin to actually try to. Uh, change what's going on at at least some of the, the, the technocratic levels of governance. Yeah, I mean, I have to <laughs> express my, I don't know, my sympathy or my apology because, like I said, this is a impos impossible, impossibly large question to throw at anyone. Um, but so you mentioned that we still have these structures as as flawed or undemocratic as they might be. So. And you say that, for example, international law is so rooted in in exploitation and asymmetry. Do you think that these shells can be filled with new content? Can they be 
used in an emancipatory way? Or is it better to just work completely I mean, outside of it? I don't know. I think I, 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 I don't think working outside of it will work. I just think mm-hmm. there's just too much power on the other side. You know, mm-hmm. it's not 1848 or even 1917 or 1919 Germany when it's total collapse of the state. I mean, these are really extraordinarily powerful institutions. They remain so. So I think it's in somewhat quixotic to try to pretend that that's not the case. But on the other hand, I think these institutions have significant problems with them, as I hope I've expressed. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's the truth. I don't know what, what would be the best thing to do or... Um, or or uh, how best to approach it, but it, w- whatever we've been doing so far hasn't worked. Um, maybe it's just more of the same. Maybe it's developing new coalitions. Maybe it's developing new types of strategy. Um, I don't honestly know. I mean, I have to say that your I find your honesty or your honest answer to this really refreshing. Um, Why would people usually say like organize? Yeah, I, I, you know, I feel like the left says organize a lot when they don't know what to actually do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, and that's not, you know, I don't mean to be dismissive because I think we all don't know what to do. Um, so it's scary. Uh, but I think we just have to be very, you know, aware of what's going on. Yeah, because I mean, it kind of feels like uh, like banging your head against the same wall over and over and waiting for a different result. Um, one thing I'm really looking forward to is your friend Matt Chrisman's book, which from my understanding, he said starts from the premise that, okay, we've, we failed. <laughs> we need to rethink, which I think is very sensible. Because I think Matt has a lot of interesting ideas and is someone who's uh, also um, facing, or, 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 you know, as all, all of us are trying to face these really difficult questions, honestly, and openly. And I think he's a, a really good thinker. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think the book will be a, an important one. Yeah. And just, I think for me, the important one you just used is honesty, just being honest about the predicament and facing up to it. And that's the first step of Marxism. Yeah, the first step of Marxism is, I think, being honest and or trying to be as honest as one can. I mean, I, I, every individual perspective is necessarily limited, and one has to listen to other people and see where they're coming from. But uh, the, I think that the starting point is really being honest about your own historical situation and the power situation as it, as it uh, exists in, in your historical moment and the, the historical moment you want to engender change in. Yeah, awesome. I think we don't have a lot of time left. I mean, of course, you have the podcast going and your scholarship going on what else are you busy working on right now that is exciting that you want to talk about and that people should check out i have a re- when is this coming out uh probably in like three or four weeks okay cool so this will be a while so in three or four weeks um people should check out uh an article that i will have had that, that actually already appeared um, in The Nation on Twitter that I spent a lot of time on. Um, I have an article of Samuel Moyne's new book, Humane, um, that uh, I hope people will engage with. Um, and then otherwise, uh, uh, nothing in the short term, but I'm, I'm working on two edited volumes, one of which is on the history of Cold War liberalism, the other of which is on the domestic history of US foreign policy making. But most important, if people want to have their best nerve fix, uh, mm. please um, listen to and subscribe to American Prestige, my podcast that I do with Derek Davison. We explore um, what's going on in the world in US foreign policy while also taking deep dives on things like, uh, Nico, you mentioned on the history of climate, um, you know, the portrayal of Vietnam and video games, um, what's literally going on in places like Syria. And you know, it takes a lot of work, and we really do appreciate patrons and subscribers who could help us continue to do uh, this work that we hope is, uh, you know, at least uh, changing some people's minds. Yeah, I mean, I've listened to your podcast, and I can uh, vouch for it. It's, it's, oh, thank inf- you. <laughs> inf- it's informative and funny and entertaining. Uh, everything, everything we like in a podcast. Great. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Nico. I really appreciate being here.